That's what I'm going to present very quickly, the process. Let me see if I can turn this around. Existing market conditions, we presented the market analysis and the parking study. I'm going to go over it very, very quickly. We presented it on Tuesday, and then spend some time showing you what we've come up with this week, our shred proposals, and then the Q&A. So, one quick thing, there's been a, a tremendous amount of confusion on whether we're doing this plan or another plan. And we are not working on this plan. However, this plan shows that you all have a history of being very visionary in what you do. And this was uh, this this work was done by I mean free by this uh, young Argentinian Italian architect Laura, and um, it was done a few years ago. And while some of the conditions are no longer valid because your performing arts center isn't going there, and so on, and you know the new church has gone in, um, it shows that you have a history of being very visionary, and it's good to know what you want to be so that you can figure out sort of where you're going. And you know if there's any indication that you are you have a tradition of dreaming big, it's this. You took a target site and you redeveloped a wonderful plaza that we've been enjoying on a daily basis where the station plaza is right now. Whoops, sorry. And this building here is a bit problematic on the other side of this one, I should, I should say, and we've got a few suggestions for that. But you have a history of, uh, I mean, from the, from the uh, painting that's out there with the developers, you have a history of really trying to uh, be very dream very big in terms of the vision for your downtown. So um, we want to urge you to continue in that tradition. And obviously, you've just finished probably an exhaustive, comprehensive plan uh, set up. Or you probably, this, this came out about two years ago, and uh, sorry, two weeks ago. And the goals that you see here, I won't read them, but they're 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 very rational, and it's really what has guided our work. Other than okay, you want to protect your community resources. You want to strike a balance between demand, development, and preservation, which is very important, and you want to create a distinctive sense of place. And then, you've also got a goal that says, how are we going to measure our progress and success? And so, hopefully, in an ideal world, what this plan is going to do is give you a roadmap of how you can go and develop your downtown. Uh, and if it's adopted, and people have asked us, you know, is this, people have been streaming in the past few days, and they've asked us, is this the last time we can comment on the plan? And, We've told them no, absolutely not. The city has actually gone through the um, expense of scheduling this charrette. It's above and beyond what your public process typically requires. And so that's, um, so this is the beginning of it. Now we're gonna go back to our offices and put a, bring all this information together and then uh, you'll go through your regular public review process. But hopefully, if it's adopted or a version of it's adopted once you've all had a chance to look at it, every plan that comes through your downtown should be measured against these, these ideas. And so yeah, I just threw in the charrette schedule to say, you know, you've all been very kind to us and very accommodating and very polite and very, um, and, and, and people have come in here legitimately curious about what, what's been going on with some good ideas. And it's been, it's, been, it's been a real pleasure being here. And you've got a very nice downtown and we hope, we, we hope our proposal will have done your, you justice. So, 275 acres, bounded by Bodley on the, on the north, Clay, Taylor, and Fillmore, and, Wood, and Woodbine on the bottom, and that's, that's a lot of land. And this, but that's the area we've been focused on. We did, and I presented this on Tuesday, but we did a very thorough existing conditions analysis looking at your street network, looking at where your open spaces are, looking at how your transit works, and, and you've got the, you know, the wonderful idea of the electric cable or car downstairs that's being explored. You've got community facilities throughout your entire downtown, lots of surface parking lots and structured parking, and, and some historic districts, some existing uh, his, uh, local landmarks, and then a national historic district as well. So we've been taking all that into consideration as we start to move with some certain proposals for you. And we've documented the character as well, not only from a, uh, a physical standpoint, but also from a zoning standpoint. Because what's on the ground is where we sort of take off. We have to respect the zoning generally speaking, what people are allowed to do on their property. So here's the zoning. It's pretty rational overall. There are some uh, strange, you know, sort of outliers, but that can be easily rationalized. But we, but we took every zoning category and we documented it from, a, um, from the suburban types that you have here and the urban types you have here as well. And, you know, even though your zoning code is much better than in most cities we work in, uh, there, we are going to be suggesting some tweaks, and you'll see we've got a few suggestions already. 
Now, in terms of the market study, I've got two or three slides here just to encapsulate what, what we found out. But Jacob, um, a sub-consultant to us, or partner with us, did the market study and the parking study. And they, they focused on the metropolitan uh, area, they focused, focused on the city of Kirkwood, and then your downtown. And your downtown has 1,250 people, your city of about 28,000 people. And when they looked at the demographics, when they looked at the retail, when they looked at uh, the housing, they really looked at the downtown in comparison to these two, um, these two areas, just as a basis of, of, uh, well, of comparison. So we have a lot of statistics about you all in terms of your demographics. A few things really stood out to us. So for example, 82% um, of the households have three, or, or three people or less, and 68% have one or two people. What this tells us is your, your, um, the way your demographics are growing are in sort of contradiction to the housing stock you have here. You've got beautiful single family. But what, the, what Jacob's housing study has shown us, or the market study has shown us, is that there is a real need for other kinds of housing here. And it's been supported by residents who have come in and said, you know, I heard from more than one person, my child had to leave here, couldn't live here because they couldn't afford to live here. So we've heard we want attainable, affordable housing downtown. We've heard we want expensive housing downtown. There's no reason why you can't have both. And there's no reason why your downtown couldn't accommodate, you know, some nice housing there as well. And the other very interesting, so that was about resident housing. And that entire study, by the way, is about 100 pages long, and that also will be made available to you. But the other thing that was interesting is that you, um, from a commercial standpoint and an office standpoint, you have about 915 people who live in and work in Kirkwood. And then you have about the same amount of people who are commuting into town and those commuting out of town. So you have about 11,400 people who probably cannot afford to live here, but they work here. And so finding housing, finding a way to capture the housing of those people in your downtown would be a good start. And then those that are commuting out, now there's a lot going to St. Louis, as I explained on um, last week or on Tuesday, but some of them may be looking for some innovative, some co-working space that they don't, that, that if, they, if that kind of space was created here, you could capture some of those people here as well. And what Jacob's told us here is that there's a need for greater diversity of not only residential building types, but also office types. So we've taken that information, we've built it into what we're proposing to you today. Now, in terms of key recommendations, the first one was remo removing code and procedural barriers to developing small multifamily housing, actively recruit unique retail. You know, retailing is incredibly complex, it's very difficult, it's constantly changing. What we do know is that those that thrive and those that do well is because they have, they're very creative, they have a real entrepreneurial spirit, they know how to, they know how to market themselves, not only to local population, but to a greater region as well. And you have some incredible, so you've got a lot of good things going through. You've got a, a, a downtown with some great character. You've got 600,000 people who go to the Magic House on a yearly basis. You've got 750,000 people who bike on the Grants Trail. A lot of those folks may be on activating your downtown the way they could be right now. And so just know that there's tremendous potential there uh, to capitalize upon. And you, you need more restaurants, non-chain restaurants, because those that you do have that are successful, we hear, are constantly crowded on a Friday and a Saturday night in particular. Um, we were told you need to address parking from a holistic perspective, and I'll touch on that. We need to encourage developments and integrate the existing character of Kirkwood. So it's okay to have the big scale buildings like you have out here, but you also need a smaller scale. There's more in keeping with a lot of the character that you have here. We don't want to say you shouldn't have bigger buildings, but you shouldn't preclude the smaller buildings too that can, that can make that development accessible to a much wider range of people. Um, test the market for co-working space. And then actually Jacob said commission a hotel market study, but I struck that out because what we have heard consistently and what we know already is that there is a need for a hotel tomorrow here. So instead, we're thinking you should be considering a retail study. And I'll speak a little more about that later on. Uh, so, the, the parking. The parking's been controversial. We've probably, ironically, spent a lot of time talking about the parking. But Jacobs came in, they tagged every single lot in your downtown, and then they, um, they counted the number of parking spaces that exist in every single one of them. And they classified them by public, whether they're private, unrestricted, or private restricted. So, you have in your downtown area close to 6,000 parking spaces. And so at five spaces per thousand or four spaces per thousand, that means you could accommodate easily 1.5 million square feet of 
commercial. You don't have any, you don't have that at all. But what that study has shown us is that you have more parking than you know what to do with, even though there are some hotspots in some areas where it's difficult to find parking. But of everybody that has come in and spoken to us this week, when we have asked the question, yes, it's hard to find parking right in front of where you want to go, but has anybody ever had trouble finding parking about a block or two from where they want to be, we have heard no. And Jacob's work actually s s uh, shows that, explains that quite clearly. So they came in here now once on a daytime, on a Tuesday, and they counted parking from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. And what they realized, and so the colors represent, the yellow colors represent that the parking is 25 to 50% full, the greens are zero to 25%, the orange is 50 to 75 percent, and the dark red is the ones we really pay attention to, which are 75 to 100 percent full. But what they realize is collectively, while you have hot spots during the day, as you can see where the red is, your parking was occupied at 41 percent only. And at night, it's a reverse, right? You know where the hot spots are, you all know them very well. Third, but 37 percent of the spaces are occupied. So, um, as hard as it is to believe, and the perception that there's a lack of parking is the real one, we don't want to undermine that. The reality of it is, you all have to all decide if that's where you want your the city to focus money in building a parking garage, or could that money be spent on a better performing art center, or improving your streets, or adding bike lanes, or a whole host of ideas we have for you. That will have to make its way through the public process, but we feel we would be um, derelict in our duties to recommend you build a parking garage unless Unless, and you can pilot program this and do a lot of things, unless it's done on a city property and maybe they enter into a PPP and there's a role, there's a need for it, you all decide after it's been evaluated that you want more parking. It's not impossible, but you'll have to figure out if that's what you want. Now, people have said, I can't find parking, it's hard to find parking, but nobody thinks twice about going to the Galleria Mall and walking the 10 minutes that it takes from one end to the other. That's your mall, right? So that's the same walk that you have downtown. But this could be way more pleasant. We're used to doing this, and we don't think twice about being in here and walking from one end to the other. You want your downtown to be that good too, right? So, um, and if the environment is conducive to better walking, and uh, people will do it, and it'll be good for your retailers, because they want lots of foot traffic in front of them. Now, in terms of parking management strategies, yeah, I have to throw this in because it's a little bit, it's a little lighthearted, but there's lots of great ways in which to manage your parking, and Jacob is going to help us sift through this, but I wanted to list all the number of ways in which you're going to be made. So, the parking is going to get better, and the parking is going to get better because there will be opportunities to, uh, to negotiate shared parking agreements, to decide, you know, to make it more obvious what people can park. There are opportunities to regulate parking from a time or a use or duration standpoint. Some people have said to us, we need 15 minute parking in front of some shops. Bob Gibbs, who's this national retail consultant, said to us, um, you know, we're encouraging also on-street parking in many places where you don't have it because that is, uh, that provides tremendous value to the retailers who, um, who are right behind those spaces. And I asked him, and he, he's repeated this to me a thousand times, but I can never remember it, but he emailed it again to me today. A parking space in front of a retail store is equivalent to $150,000 to $200,000 in sales for that retailer, as long as you're not allowed to park there for 20 minutes. So it's a tremendous value to those retailers. So you want to have that there. Um, you want better striping, because sometimes, you know, your parallel parking is it's not marked. People take 20, you know, 20 feet before next to the one that they're parking in front of or behind. So if we were to stripe it, all of a sudden you can have much more parking. Better signage for parking. Many people have come in and said to us, oh, we knew the, the, the parking that's visible was public. We didn't realize the one where the residential community is public too. So signing that and making it available and people understanding that the parking garages are there that have 630 parking spaces, that's also possible. Employee remote parking, trying to encourage that. Subsidizing ride sharing. There are cities now, uh, in New Jersey, for example, that have decided instead of building a 10 million parking garage, they're going to subsidize Uber drivers to, uh, for them to drive people from their home to the train station at a cost of $167,000 a, um, a year. Imagine how many years you can do that rather than build a parking garage. And now with ride sharing increasing and increasing, there's, there are tremendous opportunities. Improving says, transit, you're, test, you're going to test an electric cable car, that would be great, and then definitely adjusting your parking ratios, which we think are too high. 
and obviously improving your walking and biking environment. So we're going to be proposing a whole host of strategies that's going to definitely improve it for you. Now, our charrette proposals. Jacob identified potential redevelopment sites for us, and then and they're, they're covered by the, the short term, zero to 10 years, and long term, uh, 10 and over. It's not to say that this property, for example, where the, where the uh, global market in the wall region is going, to, is going to develop, but those buildings have a timeline attached to them. 20 years from now, it's not unreasonable to imagine that they will redevelop. So, same thing for the housing projects that are here. There are condos that are very hard to imagine how they would redevelop, but we are seeing this. You know, in some very robust markets, we are seeing redevelopments of these kinds of buildings in a very strategic, phased manner. So this is not in any way an indication of whether a property owner is willing to redevelop or not, um, it's, but it's an indication of the state of the buildings, the state of the, uh, how much land they have that could, in which they're not building to full capacity. As property values increase, people want to take advantage of that and want to, and want to build it up. So what we, we took their chart and we started to identify the areas that we were going to focus on and really look at. So the green are the ones we're suggesting, we were thinking, even though they were identified as sites, we may want to retain them for now, or maybe think long term. And then the reds are ones in which many of them are city on city owned properties that we think could eventually be redeveloped. And you know, it's strange to make master planning proposals on private sites. You're going to see us you're going to see that us having done that. But what we want to impart to you is that what we're giving to you is more of a framework plan and not so much of a master plan because Everybody did master plan proposals, but that property owner may like what's shown or may not like what's shown. They may go off and do their own thing. We want to make sure that at a minimum it meets the goals that we established, that we collectively established for what you want that master plan to be. So what you're seeing on private property is really suggestions. The framework plan is what can be activated and regulated. So. I showed this on Tuesday. We did what's called a frontage analysis, in which we, I, we, we took a walk through your downtown and we graded your frontages from a good, fair, and regrettable uh, <laughs> analysis. So the good means you've got great buildings, they have character, they're pedestrian scaled, they are activated, you know, it's not a blank wall or anything, and there are minimum, minimal curb cuts, meaning driveway cuts and access to the garage and all of that. Uh, and you have a lot of the good, and, and it's, the good is concentrated exactly where you would think it's concentrated, more on the north, less on the south, but you still have some areas. Uh, the, the, the fair are those automobile scale buildings that are, that are not set back 100 feet, they may just have a row parking in front of them, they may have some curb cuts, but it's not going to be discouraging for people to walk on it, but there's room for improvement. And then of course the regrettable are those that have no active frontages, the buildings are far, you can't walk to them, constant curb cuts, inconsistent lighting. You know, and you, you take a look at this building, which is as good as a strip mall can ever get. But if you're on this sidewalk, there's not one sidewalk that takes you from this one to the building this way. So what that tells you is that nobody's thinking about how you walk to that place. So if you don't provide that, nobody will do it. So that's just showing you that everybody's, you're expected to drive there. And it's a shame, in your downtown, you should have those options available to you. So we took this, and from this plan, we said, okay, every city, the city can't invest their money everywhere, and they have, they've, we often hear, where should we put our money first? Where are we gonna get the biggest bang for our buck? And where you get the biggest bang for your buck is where you already have a lot to work with. It's not to say they shouldn't go investing in other places, but what's also important is for cities to, especially in their downtowns, to do what we call an A, B, and C grid. C grids are typically for alleys. You don't have a, a system of alleys here, so we've just restricted it to A and B. And the A grid is to say, everybody deserves in their downtown to have an excellent pedestrian experience. And not only an excellent pedestrian experience, but it needs to be continuous. You can't be walking along a street and all of a sudden have a degraded experience, and then back to an A experience. So that, that loop has got to be continuous. On the other hand, cities also need places for drive-throughs, for car washes, for, um, you know, all the uses that you need to keep a city functioning. And for, you know, where you allow parking. So, you know, you have a condition out here where, and not to pick on the building, but, you know, where the station plaza development where someone went to the trouble of lining up parking with residential, and then right across the street is a visible parking garage. That shouldn't happen. And if you have an A, B grid, it's okay to have exposed parking garages if they're facing other exposed parking garages. It's not okay to have exposed parking garages if you're facing residential. But you don't want to ask every developer to line themselves. So if a developer comes to you and the city says, 
Where do you want to be? You want to be on our A street? Guess what? You're going to line your garage. You don't want to be. You want to be on the B street? We may allow you not to line your garage. And it starts to set up a system that is that that decides. And yes, it's different rules and different regulations. And you can do that because the ARB already has rules that act that actively. They, I can't remember. They have preferred and discouraged rules, and that's really good. That they already know that sometimes they have to require that the, that the building behave in a better manner, and sometimes it doesn't, it's not so important. So one of the recommendations we're making is that it be tied to this AB grid that we're giving you. Now, so our preliminary framework plan, which is really what's regulatory, a master plan in and of itself is not regulatory. It's a vision plan. This could be regulatory in the context of where should you, so your B2, which is most of your downtown, you. In many cases, you require retail at grade. And you also, inadvertently, you're incentivizing retail because you reward it with different mixed use. You reward mixed use with different height. So that has had the consequence or the unintended consequences of not providing you with the housing you need downtown. And everybody obviously wants to do mixed use. But there's only so much mixed use cities can take. And there's only so much retail you can take. And you want your existing retail to be successful before you go and add a whole bunch of new retail. So. Where should you be absolutely requiring retail to occur? You know, obviously on Argonne, some of Jefferson and down and up, up and down Kirkwood, but not for everywhere. Where could it be encouraged but not required? And where do you let it go and say, you know what, if somebody wants to do residential here, that's perfectly fine. And why would you not allow them to go taller if they're going to do residential that the, the downtown needs? So these are conditions you'll have to think about that we'll be having conversations with the city about as we start to look at ways in which we can tweak your zoning. Um, now, you also have a very different grid here. You've got very nice blocks. And then obviously up here, it gets much bigger. So we're, all, we're also suggesting what we call uh, the cross-block passages, where those could be. It's hard to get a street. It's not impossible. But you can get pedestrian connections across here. And you'll see how that's been detailed. Where open space is provided, where you have civic spaces, and what we call terminated vistas. You know, some streets terminate on some important element. And for example, we identified that from Jefferson, you have a parking lot here and another parking lot there, but if this was converted, and you'll see a rendering of this, into a nice cross-block passage that terminates on this wonderful train station you have, um, all of a sudden, you know, it's a wonderful walking experience. And, what, and so the terminated vista is basically is telling property owners, if you terminate on a street, you have to give a gift to the street in the form of whatever. A cupola, a tower, a spire, a bench, a beautiful tree. It can be a whole host of things, but it's basically acknowledging the fact that you're in an area that deserves special attention. So, our preliminary framework plan is about mandating retail frontage in the downtown core, creating cross-block passages to break the scale of your oversized blocks, being specific regarding the form of open spaces. So not just saying, provide 10% open space or 15, but what are you giving us? A plaza, a park, a green, a square? It's important to know that because one, it needs to be fronted by streets, so it's not left over thought after space, or thought, you know, you have a thought about the space. And two, if it's a plaza, it's one kind of space. If it's a green, it's another kind of space. So we're going to give you rules for that, too. The termination of important, vis of important vistas and pedestrian and bike connections. So here's the illustrative master plan, and I'm, I'm zooming into it, so don't worry about it. But it basically incentivizes, don't try to read it, in other words, um, incentivize small-scale redevelopment in downtown. Because the housing said, in the next five years, the housing study said, in the next five years, you can accommodate maybe an, an up to 220 new residential units. It's not a lot, but it's a decent amount. And that can come in very different forms. So um, what we did with the master plan is really try to encourage a whole variety of, of, of building types. And you have that wonderful small-scale variety to your downtown, and you do not want to lose that. Because if you lose that, you start to become like every other place. And so um, there are ways in which you can control that and not prevent development from happening. And while there are opportunities for this kind of development, you shouldn't be allowing too much of this, because that's when you will start to see the erosion of your downtown. Um, so you're seeing a lot of different little buildings, where the cross block passages should be and what those should look like, Taming Jefferson Avenue and Clay Avenue, we've heard about this, the, the St. Michael's maybe wanting to close the street, and we have Peter's. Sorry, St. Peter's. Peter's. It's a saint. <laughs> um, maybe that's why. He's a bit of a saint here. <laughs> um, I would have suggestions for you as to what that could look like. Um, activate the land along the rail line, augment your open space network, support the bicycle and pedestrian network, 
and evaluate options for the Jefferson. Oh, that's the same thing as this. Sorry, so I should have, we can erase that. All right. Now, and, and you know, Mike threw the five minute head shed over this, which basically shows you where your downtown core is, which is exactly what that five minute walk is. And you know, and by the way, I get the easy task of sitting here and getting to present this work, but we have, you know, where are the designers? Greg and Mike and Javier and David, who's still drawing, still are <laughs> the ones who really deserve a lot of credit for this, for having the role. <laughs> Um, this looks like little tiny buildings and little tiny greens. It is incredibly well thought of. And I'll tell you why it's very well thought of. Because you have existing parcels lines and you have existing property lines. And the developments they did respected those property lines. So what you're seeing here is not just a building plot down, you know, straddling two different properties. It's very thoughtfully done. And that's hard to do. And that's why you're not seeing these grandiose plans. It's not to say that different property owners can't get together and do something magical. But we wouldn't be doing your service if we were just imagining the property owners were going to get along and do that. So it doesn't preclude it, but we're, 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 taking, we're, we're developing this from, from, a, from a, an understanding of, well, how do different individual property owners get to develop their property? So this is a very complex map. You can see all the different property lines. And, you're, and it's laid over the master plan because they were very careful in making sure that buildings respected those property lines as they laid them in. And we got, obviously, more ambitious with City Oak Land, because we can. So there's a, you'll see that the open space network has increased tremendously, and these cross block passages can be wonderful places. And we'll show you photos of what that can look like. All the purple is where we're thinking of adding them, or where they could be added, I should say, including, obviously, where your new performing arts center is going to be. And here we've heard a lot about the Grand Trail and how it can connect to the downtown. So we've proposed some routes too. Now, obviously it means in some places acquisition of private property, and that's never easy, or an agreement in which that can happen. But the good news is, is there are many ways in which you can do that. But it means dedicated bike lanes in some places, uh, and, uh, and sometimes it's shared bike lanes as well on the streets. And we're going to show you street sections of what that can look like. But there are opportunities to connect the Grand Trail through your downtown to your park over here. So here's one example. Now here it is up here. This is where you have the global market and the, and the Walgreens and the Alpine and then the bank building. It looks half empty. It's a great opportunity site, a potential opportunity site. And way more parking than they need. So, and this is the AT&T parking lot. So this is... 20 years down the line, 15 years down the line, if they choose to redevelop, how would that look? And so what, what Mike did is put plazas in front of every building to give people an access from the sidewalk to the building. You know, and then uh, allowing them the opportunity to line the first row of parking with some buildings. Here, this is the imagining a grocer. We've heard you want a grocer downtown. This could be a good location. They could build off the synergy of the global market because they, they offer different things. People are coming from St. Louis to go find stuff there. You know, it's actually a really nice institution you have here. And then there's obviously then this cross block passage here that connects you from Taylor to Clay. And then you have this jewel of a building here. I forget the name of it. But what we did is we tried to uh, frame it with a green in here. We put townhouses around, around it here, small multifamily buildings here. And then even townhouses. And I'll show you what those look like in here. The gas stations are here right now. They will stay until it becomes feasible for them to redevelop. And then it could be a small commercial buildings. They're anywhere from 40 to 60 feet wide. And then you have opportunities for lots of ports. And we'll show you what that looks like. So here's the, the view of Kirkwood Avenue with these liner buildings. And you know, many cities across the country are now putting in these liners. They're cheap. And the way to get these liners to be built is to tell the property owners, you don't have to provide parking for them. Build them, activate the space, do not require parking. Because if you require parking, they won't build them. Now, near the train station, there's, you know, there's lots of opportunities too. So this is a city-owned lot, and this is a city-owned lot. And we spoke a lot about, do we show a parking garage, don't we? Is it really needed? But we said, let's do one proposal that puts it in here. So we put a parking garage with a three-story liner in front of it. Here's the parking that the city leases right now that could be converted into, for those of you who know Georgetown and Washington, D.C., uh, M Street is hugely valuable, but one block towards the waterfront, they have something called Caddy's Alley, which was this old alley. And now, as I said, many cities around the country are doing it. We just happened to be there last week, so it's fresh in our minds. They, and they, the Caddy's Alley is a wonderful place where the 
businesses who can't afford to be on Main Street can be incubated <coughs> in those alleys, and they can be cheap, and they can be funky, and they, you know, the young ones love to hang out there. And so we are going to propose that for here. And so maybe if this, there's about 80 spaces here, they can go in here. Um, and so there's a potential for a, um, a boutique hotel here. There's a potential for a boutique hotel here. And then this is the ex imagined expansion of the farmer's market. You know, some people want to see it moved here, other people like it there, but it's giving them a green, a nice green in which they can spin up. We've heard they use that space all year round and it's wonderful. It's really a nice amenity that you have downtown. Um, and it's giving people opportunities too, on their own parcels, to fill in with some buildings in here and there and there, and then another multifamily building in here. And so here, here is our examples of what that can look like. It doesn't have to be pretty. It can be places where there are gardens, but they're really wonderful little spaces. And you know, you've got this. It's there already. The city, now they, they lease that space, but maybe there can be an agreement with that property owner to say, let us activate this with little pop-ups. And people, you know, there's always people who have ideas in your community, but who can't afford to go rent space somewhere. You let them incubate their business here, you know? And that's the way, that's the way it goes. So I have 15 more minutes on these told. And that's what this looks like. So the wonderful thing about it is this is a city-owned property. And as you walk through this alley, boom, it terminates on the train station. And there's a potential location for the hotel. So this is a really nice thing you should really consider doing. And if you don't activate it with buildings and make it a really beautiful little linear park, as you started to do just up here. Oh, have you labeled it the Kirk Walk, which kind of sticks. So there may be Kirk Walks, your cross block passages. Um, and now this is the Performing Arts Center. The Performing Arts Center is coming here on the south side of the tracks. Uh, it's fixed, we know it's coming in here. So um, how do you start to activate the space around it and how do you start to really engage people and give them a good walking experience from you know, the north side down to the south side? And so what this is starting to do is show you how, um, how Monroe can be activated with live works or multifamily uh, buildings here, with opportunities for restaurants that can spill out in, into a terrace here. There's a nice plaza here, we've augmented it. Um, there could be a little children's play area here, or a little secret garden in here that uh, Jacob told us they had been thinking about. The parking for them is back here. Eventually it'll just be a parking lot, but, event but down the line it could be lined with housing. And we'll sh well, I'm gonna show you exactly what that looks like. And then we began to look at this space as infill. And by the way, so, sorry, here's the plan. I'll, I'll show it to you this way. Here are the different building types. This is the ho a boutique hotel just north of the um, of the, of the, where your post office is now, because you could do it there. You could put townhouses here along the track with a little community building there. These could be mixed use buildings. This is obviously the, you know, the wonderful uh, AM church, this is your newer church, that has a big parking lot here, but how about giving people access from Kirkwood to the Performing Arts Center? So since you have this road already, we've lined it with office liners, cheap office liners, and then a walk back here that can get you here. And then these are liner buildings, some senior housing, some colleges, some townhouses, some, a few single families. It's got a really rich type of, uh, once you start to do the six packs and all these different housing types, all of a sudden you start to see, this, is a, this could become a really wonderful neighborhood. It could also be an area in these pink buildings where you start to incubate some businesses. And I mean, look at all that you can do here. It's tremendously rich. And you know, have you got a green, you put in a little turbine plaza here, another one there, and this could really be, over the next 20 years, developed into really incrementally, but beautifully. And this is a view down Monroe. You know, this, this is developed now, but this is what that could look like here, with the uh, performing arts center back here and the hotel peeking out right back there. Now, if you were here this week, you heard us speak about the missing middle housing, which is you know, you have a single family, you have the, the tall, four, five-story multifamily, but that missing fabric in between, which is what our cities are made of, and in particular, what your cities are made of, um, need, need to be reintroduced into our vocabulary, into our, into our lexicon of how we build, we need to be encouraging developers to build this kind of housing. You know, you've got a very rich tradition of it right in your backyard. And so, when you hear us speak, talk about six-packs, this is what they look like. So six packs, they're called sometimes mansion apartments because they look like a, a, you know, a large family, a, um, a large single family house. There's only one door, you don't see multiple doors. And as you walk in to a central hallway, there's one unit on, on this side and one unit on that side. And they, they have windows on all three sides. It's really an elegant way to live. 
You can go up two stories and put four units. You can go up three stories and put six units. And the wonderful thing about them is that they, they fit on a 72 by 100 foot lot and they don't need surface parking, they don't need underground parking, they can be built really easily and really cheaply. And we need to be activating this. And we actually took a site that we heard, we know was controversial, that on the top of, at the top of uh, Bodley, in front of this building, a property owner came and we said, let's just try it, test this out. And so we put this six pack, potentially an eight pack in here. And it, can, it fits beautifully, it's quite contextual. So we want to be encouraging these kinds of buildings in these areas. And these are what the liners look like. So parking liners here, you can park underground. On the ground floor it's parking, but you would never know it by looking at the building. And then it's, uh, it's you know relatively affordable housing above. This happens to be a really beautiful one in Florida, but it doesn't have to be. In the back, look at it, it's nothing special at all. But it's a great way to start to activate either cheap or cheaper office space or residential space. Live Works, you know, we lost the tradition of building in Live Works. Uh, this is Kenton's, where our office is outside of DC. It, it's ways for people to offset their mortgage. You know, they rent the space downstairs to a business and they live above, or they live, they work down here and they rent above. There's all sorts of ways in which you can do that. And you know, as more and more people are starting to work from home, you know, they want a workspace, this is a good way to provide them. And they fit on a 20 foot, 24 foot lot, it's like a townhouse, but they have a commercial use grade. Cottage courts also, you know, wonderful way to be. This is a new town, St. Charles, another one of our projects. So they built these, and this is a really good for senior housing because they have, they don't have a lot of yard they have to take care of, but they have a shared yard where they can come and be active and socialize. And some people are putting these as community gardens. So we're seeing people build these, these pocket neighborhoods, these cottage courts all around the country. And you, you know, you have really wonderful opportunities to embed these in your downtown as well. We're showing you these because we've forgotten how to build these. Well, now it's starting to be it's starting to be reintroduced again, and there's a whole there's a national movement towards reintroducing these kinds of building types. You know, senior housing. In this case, this is one built in Oklahoma in one of our projects, but they have a little community. This is for people who want a little yard. Everybody has a courtyard there, one story. Everybody has, has uh, there's a bedroom on the ground floor, and, and it's just really a really nice way to live. And it's not on a large lot. It's barely 120 by maybe 180 feet. I don't remember, but that's kind of what it looks like. And obviously it gets adapted. And then there are tower houses, and tower houses are for people are where you can when you have a little piece of land left over, and, you can, and they're like a townhouse except it's it's standalone, fee simple. Uh, on your property, you tuck under, you may park on the ground floor, and then you have living spaces above here. Um, and by the way, this is also from Ketlin's work where, where we work, and there are 75 year olds buying this because they say, you know, if you stop moving and stop climbing stairs when you start to decline. So. As we used to think that 70 year olds never wanted to buy tall, but that's not true. That's not what we're hearing anymore. Anyway, so they are buying these, and these, these fit on 30 by 40 foot lots, and again, they have a shared space in the middle. And so then, um, Greg took some of your housing, so this is some of your uh, multifamily buildings that are quite stable for right now, but 20 years from now, they're going to look aged and they may want to redevelop. So how do you re redevelop this site? It's more in keeping with the residential character that you have on, on clay, but, but, but retains at least the number of units you have here. And so he did some proposals with townhouses or the tower houses, and both of these get more units than what's here. And he did it again <coughs> on the south side. Here's another project right here on clay. And he did this with six packs for townhouses. Now you could obviously mix and match, and it makes sense to mix and match, but just to understand the concept, we, la we laid them down just to see what that would look like. And then, you know, so here's another idea for your downtown. You know, so another, every designer has their own ideas. And in this case, um, this is one in which David noticed that the, the rail line has this wonderful arch, you know, crescent shape to it, which is actually very rare. And so, and you're looking at the back of the building here, and you thought about, well, why don't we append buildings to it here? So that as you're crossing here, the crossing gets tied, and you can see really nice, you know, you can have some very nice buildings all along the edge here. There could be all kinds of spaces, from residential to office and all of that. The train station is here. You have a grassy area here, which is maintained by some kind of a Kirkwood club. It's got bushes and everything. Well, I would take it down and put a plaza there and just activate that space too. There's a potential room for a boutique hotel, some buildings back here. This is just basically showing that these buildings could go taller, they could add to their floors here. And then you're gonna see we've got a bunch of sections for Argonne, and we've heard everything from 
take, get, get rid of the median and give us wider sidewalks on the edge to increase the size of the median. And we've done, we've done both, and we're going to show you both. But they're really wonderful opportunities to um, really think of the space. This is a really unique space you have here. And, and it's incredible how, how beautifully it can be activated. And again, the idea of framing, the, giving the farmer's market or the market that's here you know, a nice, decent, elegant green in which they can, their, unit, their produce can spill out into. And another opportunity here maybe for a boutique hotel. So, now I know this sounds crazy, but you talk about how, how can the city create value? Well, they can plant land and then lease it out to market pavilions. You see these kinds of buildings. Now, this is England, okay. But this is San Jose, California, and this is uh, uh, Alpharetta, Georgia, where they've got these big greens in the middle and they activate them with market pavilions. And you have the space to do that on Argonne. And so here he actually took that building and put it right in your downtown. Here's what you look like now. Here's what that could look like. You're not, we're not saying you should do this kind of architecture, but you have the width to make these little pavilions, these follies, these wonderful little buildings that, you know, even they could, people could spit out. They could also be your incubator uh, office space or retail space. Um, and I'm going to show you what that looks like. On, so very quickly, I don't have a lot of time. This this, pro, this building is problematic on so many levels, and we know that the retail struggles here. No, and it's a real problem because you have the station plaza here that's really nice. It's your downtown, and so you really need to be thinking about how this can be fixed. And we've got ideas from. Uh, well, this is what it looks like now. Even if you were to take a, a glass box and literally literally append it to the building, and give that that owner who struggles with their retail, the opportunity to come out and sell their wares out there, that's important to do. So this is, this is us being a little more ambitious about it and saying, here's the glazing. You only have one parking space here. So you get rid of it, you widen the sidewalk, and then you could even give the residents up here an opportunity to have a balcony. Now, this is, this is hard to do, no doubt about it, but this is not hard to do. So depending on the will of that, of the, and I think the property owner, you know, he or she must understand that it's hard to, to lease that retail. We've heard it's very hard. So there may be ways in which to try and encourage us to, to do something as cheap as something like that. And automatically, it may it make your space look better. That's not expensive either. Now, rethinking our streets. You know, if we look at where, how much space, is, you know, our streets occupy up to 25% of the land of our downtown. And so, we don't think about how much of it is devoted to cars. I love this image by a, a, a Swedish guy. So we're giving you now. I'm going to run through these very quickly. I can't explain to you all the different variations you have, but you'll have time to look at them, evaluate them, and judge them on their own merit. This is what Argonne Street looks like now, where the parking is, how wide your lanes are, and what the median looks like. You could remove the median and widen sidewalks here and park here. You could widen the sidewalk, make the median a little smaller, and still do the parking. You could widen the sidewalks and do parallel parking instead of head-in parking. Parallel parking on both sides instead, and you get the same amount of parking. You could widen the median and all of a sudden, you know, at 34 feet, start to do what we showed you at Avalon or in Santana Road with these little buildings that activated. And that's what it looks like in Avalon. It's nothing, you know, spectacular, but they're wonderful places, ice cream places, places for kids to play chess and to sit down and, you know, have an ice cream or whatever it is you want to do. Now, this is Paris, fine, but what they do also is they have parking in the median. In the if you really need parking, you can also convert that to parking, but plant trees in between the tree in, in between the um, in between the cars, so that when the cars aren't there, it functions as a plaza. So that's also a possibility. And then we've also done this with Kirkwood. We've taken your Kirkwood section, and, it, and your right-of-way varies along this edge, but we've looked at ways in which you could, and you know, this is going to be vetted with your public works and your engineer, of course, but we've looked at ways in which we can add parking on one side, <coughs> continuous turn lane, widen sidewalks, and a whole host of options, even adding a protected cycle tracks on Kirkwood, because it, have to, it would have to be protected if it were on Kirkwood, but you have the you have the space to do it, and more. And then it gets wider in some areas, and we've done all sorts of sections for you too. So that's what that. And then, okay, now Jefferson here, where the the church is looking to maybe get this. Would you guys, and they, you know, and they have this diagonal crossing here. Like, it's not they. You have this. Um, if you're going to decide whether, really, as a community, you want to vacate that right away or not, know that you have many options before you get to that. Oh gosh, two minutes left. One is to say, 
and parking on both sides, really give them a race walk here where they can really slow traffic down. If you were to keep, were to keep the street, because we understand kids cross over, you could make it one way and bulb outs. You make it one way, all of a sudden, it wouldn't, the, the, if you wanted to keep that right away, all of a sudden it'd be easy for cars to, uh, to cross over, I mean for the pedestrians to cross. You can add angled parking and make angled parking with a one way, or you could even make it pedestrian. Now, 10 quick things for your zoning code. We're calling zoning acupuncture because it's not a major redo of your zoning code, but what could, we, what could you do immediately? One thing you could do is waive parking requirements for liners. This is a project about the Paul Mashpee Commons outside of Rhode Island, which they built these tiny little buildings to screen parking. If you want to encourage your property owners who have this to do this kind of thing, let them do it and let them not provide parking. Remove surface parking as a permitted use in B2. Do not allow a property owner to come in and just put a surface parking lot in your downtown. You deserve better. Measure height in stories, not feet, and reconsider height measurements for roofs. So this is Charleston, in which we went into the city of Charleston and helped them exactly do that, figure out how to convert stories into height. And because if, look, every city has this variegated roof scape, and you do too, but the minute you establish a height at 65 feet or 50 feet, every building starts to do that, and you start to see inelegant floors. So you want to be able to, and, but it means that some of your buildings may get taller than 65 feet. But if it's 70 feet, but you get generous floor seating height, it shouldn't be a problem. And not everybody's going to do that. And office users have a different need for off the height than residential users. Uh, reduce parking ratios, encourage shared parking, and permit <coughs> outside parking within 500 feet. Right now you permit it within 300 feet. You could increase that, but your parking ratios are way too high. Now you do some really great things in your code too. Like in your residential areas, you, you really have this very complicated way, the logical way of saying, your setback in the front has to be the average of the setbacks of every plot around you. That's really good for the R5, because it, 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 it means that your multifamily next to your single family is going to have the same appearance. It's not so good for your downtown. You have this in your downtown too, unless I've understood it incorrectly. And you really need the downtown buildings to have a zero foot lot line and come right up against the sidewalk for commercial uses. So that's a good rule for some areas, not so good for others. Remove the minimum required unit size, size from zoning in B2 and R5 and maximum number of units tied to height in R5. So you have some very funky things that are precluding you from getting smaller units. So downtown, your average unit size has to be 1,200 square feet. Why? Bring it lower. Encourage smaller units, it'll be more affordable. That's one thing. Another thing is, we understand why this is exist, why you have this in R5, again, less so in, in, in other districts, but you, you restrict the number of dwelling units. Ironically, this is encouraging, you know, the six packs and the eight packs, but you restrict the number of dwelling units uh, to four to eight or 12 per building, the three-story buildings. We understand that, but it should be maybe, you can achieve that, but still give property owners the ability to maybe do six units per floor in a smaller building. So. That shouldn't be so bad. And what you can do is limit the, the size of the lot if you don't want to have those long bar buildings. And here you go. Establish maximum lot widths in R5 and minimum frontage occupations in B2. If there's one thing we would tell you to do in your code, which you don't have now, is to say you have to have the building in B2, especially in your downtown core or on your A grid, meet the setback line. So you have this constant building facade that, that meets you. You've been allowed for some wiggle room but it has to be at least 80%. The minute you start to allow buildings to step back, where they can put parking in front, they're gonna do it. So that's the first thing you should do change. I didn't do these in any order. Increase the maximum lot coverage in R5, it's too low at 40%. It will not allow you to do these mixed, these missing middle housing types. Regulate retail by the framework plan. Revise your church, your heights accordingly. And the ARB has some great regulations, which is just beginning to look at them. They already have preferred elements and discouraged elements. So how do they know when to require it to be preferred, when it should be discouraged? Either developers are allergic to being held to different standards. So the AOB grid could be one way in which that's activated. You may find another way, but we're proposing it be done on the AAB grid. That's my last slide. Now, so one thing. That's the Roman oath. Men do not love Rome because she's beautiful. Rome is beautiful because men don't love her. You want to remain lovable. And, and if you are lovable, people will continue to come here and visit you. Now, another thing about your city hall, and I know this is controversial, but I gotta say it. You are an elegant city. We understand the trauma you went through eight years ago. 
But you have this incredible city hall. You've got to tell people to park in the front, but enter and park in the back, and walk to the front and reopen the front door to you. And, and on the door. both sides we understand completely but would, it, it's not normal that you have such a beautiful building but you can't have enter it from the street and if you want to make your downtown you know elegant again we would really urge you to think about that as hard as it is you, you know the cop could move to the front and you park in the back that's fine you're going to have a nice walk as you come around so i'm sorry i spoke for 50 minutes but i'm going to take uh, 10 minutes for questions and answers and I want to try and balance it out and not have every question about parking. So, <laughs> if there are questions, uh, if some, I'm, I will take one question, and then if somebody has, I'll uh, ask if people have questions not related to a topic that someone else had. So, I'm happy to answer questions that anyone may have. I just want to say you've done a, a beautiful job. You've come through the past, you know, two days on Tuesday and today, and, and um, you've come up with some great ideas. And I think you Thank you. Does anyone else have? Yes, ma'am. I can move to DC mm -hmm. and be happy that Kirkwood will live on to be a wonderful community where I grew up. Well, thank you. <laughs> you have a beautiful community. Yes, sir. You mentioned co-working a couple times. Um, any suggestions, specific? Yeah, well, you know, the, the, what's taking up around the country is these WeWork spaces, but that's one kind. But would you, would you, someone who owns a retail storefront that's, had, that's struggling in downtown, all you have to do is put a little coffee machine, a, a desk, and let people know, hey, for those of you who work from home but may want to come work in a space, you just come and use it there. That's how we're seeing people start to activate their downtowns with these kinds of spaces. You know, another thing you could do is, in your downtown, at least in your core, where there are spaces, where there are buildings that are vacant, you could be encouraging people to use them. You know, dance studios, artist studios, and not make it so onerous for them to get insurance requirements and all of that, because the, the most deadly thing for a downtown are these vacant storefronts. So for those of you who own these kinds of buildings, really consider co-working spaces, because wherever they're going, people are using them, and I'm sure there's a lot of people here. Who would, who would welcome the opportunity to, for a few hours a day, to go work in a common space. Yes, sir. Uh, on the other side. <laughs> first of all, let me say this is very European, and I'm impressed, because this is how the Europeans hopefully utilize land. Second thing is, uh, the walking areas, the footstegans in there, those, those green areas. In Europe, they're connected by public transportation. They're connected by means of getting into and access to. So given the public transportation system around here, how are we going to attract people utilizing things other than the vehicles to get into here if we should make this into a walking space? Well, you know, there's always going to be people who drive into the downtown because there is no transit. And that's why we can't be overly ambitious with your parking requirements. On the other hand, there are people who live you know, on the other side of Clay and the other side of Taylor, who absolutely could walk into town. And there are people who are going to move into town who will have access to all, all of those uses within the downtown. The way to do that is to begin small. You know, you've got the electric cab, uh, cab that people are going to start, uh, they're going to t the city's going to test out. And, if you, and you're going to make your downtown streets walkable, more walkable than they are. They already are. And you've got great fabric in your downtown. So, you know, yes, we're all inspired by Europe, but what, we, what we're proposing to you to do here is completely doable. You know, the most ambitious idea is probably what you can do in your, in your center right away, but we've forgotten how much land we waste with our streets. And this is, a, this is an opportunity to show you that you could restripe it, and all of a sudden there could be a piece of land that would be available to put little buildings in. Um, so let me just take a few questions on that side, and then I'll come back to this side. Yes? Um, we talked earlier with parking as far as awareness building, and it kind of talks to many of the issues with Kirkwood. Have you had recommendations in the past as far as like having a app that people are familiar with so they it informs them of things like the cab, the electric cab, but also lost park like unknown parking, and then also obviously businesses, restaurants, retailers could use that app to yeah. activate awareness too in their That's well, a really good idea. That's a good it applies to so many parts Yeah, you're right. Have. And there's actually um, the cities are already experimenting with this in some places where um, 
what we hear is that at any given time in a downtown, 20% of the circulation is people looking for parking. So if people knew where that parking was, it'd be easier for them to manage it. And there are cities, bigger cities than you all, but that are experimenting with apps. And maybe one thing we can ask Jacobs to do is to call cities like San Francisco or Oakland and tell them, how did you do this app? And do you, are you making it available to other cities? Because if people knew where to go get their parking, it would maybe be very, um, very obvious or more obvious. Yes, sir, and then. Okay, um, you've, you've been doing this for quite some time, but in the last oh, 10 years, five years, year, we've seen the effect of the economy go from a small retailer, a large retailer, to the internet. What kind of, what kind of retail development do you foresee being sustainable against that kind of competition? So, you know, it's a combination of things, and it's not an easy answer, but there's a couple of things. One is I was telling one of your councilwomen today that probably, not to make you spend more money, but the best thing you could do is hire this retail consultant that we've worked with a lot, who is, you know, impeccably accurate. He's, he's, his name is Bob Gibbs, and he's written a book on urban retailing. And so you have, uh, you have retail shops here that some are obviously doing very well, and some are struggling a little. What he does is he comes in and he literally, and, and some of your storefronts don't work at all. He will, he literally, you know, and by the, this one out here, to add to the problems that that station plaza one has on the other side is reflective glass. Like you don't put reflective glass in shops where you want people to be able to see into it, as an example. So you have, and I'm sure, I'm sure Donna with the Downtown Authority is working on, or the Downtown Metro Association, is working with property owners to try, at least there are basic rules of what, how you should manage your storefront. People have to be able to see into it at least 20 feet to be able to be pulled in. You know, there's, and this is science. I mean, people have studied this. You know, you have eight seconds to capture somebody's attention as they walk by your storefront. So that being beautiful is one part of it. The entrepreneurial and creative spirit of the people who run those shops is also part of it. Making sure you have the right mix is another part of it. And it's very difficult because, you know, what we're suffering from in Kenton, for example, is a lot of nail salons. But it, when the buildings are, are owned individually, it's very hard to preclude one use from coming in versus another. So it's a whole host of strategies. The same way you're looking at your parking in a whole host of, in, in a very global way, the retail has to be looked at globally as well. Because but what you have is character. And, and buildings, and you and you need to preserve that. And you have to do what you can to preserve that. And what you have to do is frequent those businesses and support the businesses, and don't only order from Amazon. We all order from Amazon, and I love Amazon. But you know you have to support the local businesses that are here. And if the environment is made to be that way, then people will do it. But it also means those shop owners have to be incredibly resourceful and, and, and resilient to a certain degree. You can probably take. One or two more questions before we'll go to Commissioner Councilman Ward and then you, sir. Uh, comment. Uh, one of our residents works for a company that puts sensors in parking spaces and it works by phone app. Mm -hmm. And I introduced him to the mayor and to our city administrator, so hopefully we'll see something happen with that so people can drive around and they'll know where an empty space mm -hmm. is. And uh, second, uh, a question for you, because sometimes our voices are just as ignored as everybody else's. Um, we'll comment on what the architecture is for our theater and what you think of it. No, I don't want to do that because it's not my place to do it. I think you all have to decide what kind of architecture you want for your, for your performing arts center. And we understand that there is a, um, that there's a cost to it. Um, what I would do is tell you this. You want a building that's going to age gracefully. That would be my... So that would be the only requirement we would put for your performing arts center. It can be modern, it can be traditional, it can be anything you want. We've only seen one rendering, so it's impossible to judge it. But um, what, we would, what you need a building that's not going to be expensive to maintain, and you're going to need a building that's timeless. Your performing arts center has to be timeless, um, irrespective of style. So those would be our two comments we give you, because that's going to be a real catalyst for development for your downtown. So you really want it to be. <laughs> And there are great examples to look at, you know, around the country. Yes, sir. Can you control the type of retail that you, that you get in the downtown? An example is, we had a bookstore on a corner up here, and all of a sudden we have an AT&T store. Yeah, when well, you have the mattress store in the corner, for example. Yeah. 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 But you know you have to feel, feel for, that, for that property owner right. who, who, 
probably couldn't get anything better than a matter store, you know, in that corner. Eventually, that lease will run out. Uh, so cities have precluded certain uses from coming in, but there are unintended consequences to that. And you are at the cusp of, you know, you're not quite a revitalized downtown, so you don't want to be precluding certain uses from coming in. But you can require property owners to maintain their storefront. Like that mattress store, I would tell them at a minimum, you're not allowed to have six posters on your windows, as an example. You know, one post or whatever your signage says. So there are ways in which to make the storefront more elegant, even, you know, you know Buying a mattress is necessary, not the best use. Eventually, the property values will be such that that property owner will, will get a better tenant. But why can't we just be proactive? Well, you that, could. that property owner only cared about the square footage cost. If we had brought them four other, you know, uses that would have given them the same property, uh, I mean, per square foot of cost, they would have chosen it. Yes. We need to be proactive. Yes, you do. And um, and if you do so, you'll you'll have certainly more success doing that. So. You know, we we're happy to take questions outside, but we were told 6.30 city council starts. Yeah. Oh, I think the, the, the mayor would like to say a few words. <coughs> Thank you so much. Just so everyone knows from the city standpoint, this is just really the start of the process. Yeah. You know, we're just seeing this for the first time. I mean, we were so fortunate to get such a yes. reputable, worldwide, well-known firm to come in and give a fresh set of eyes to downtown. As, as we all know, and you said it earlier, the best way to move forward is to you know, improve on your strength. And that's really what we're doing. I think the whole city council looks at it that way. You know, downtown is what Kirkwood is. No matter where we live, people think, when they think of Kirkwood, they think of downtown. And so we want to do everything we can to make it better over, <coughs> uh, over the years. And that's why you know, this kind of study was done. So this is just the beginning of it. This is, you know, this is just the final presentation of their visit here. So over the next months, years, people will have plenty of opportunity to look at things. There's going to be development things, zoning code changes. So it's a long process. But uh, I'm just thrilled that uh, we did it, the city did it, everyone participated. And just know we're just at the start of this. But it's going to be, it's going to be a good process. It's going to be great for the entire city. So thank you very thank much. You. passionate about this and we often go into cities in which we, we, we desperately try to get them the character that you all already have here and so you know know that you're you're, you're a head start from a lot of different uh, cities you've got an incredible um, you know single-family residential districts you have the opportunity in your downtown to make the, the res the multi-family be as good as and your commercial buildings as good as your residential homes, and then you will be a first-rate, uh, first-rate city. You already are, but you can, you have the opportunity to be even better. So we, we, you are so far ahead of so many other cities. Don't forget that. Thank you. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay here until he. Um,